Hello, friends. Thank you for joining the San Jose Museum of Art this afternoon. I'm Paulina Vu, Manager of Museum Experience. We're so very excited to welcome you all to our very first virtual lunchtime lecture program. Since its 2011 inception, this series has brought forth speakers to present cross-disciplinary perspectives to complement our exhibitions and voices from the community to showcase our neighbors and our vibrant and creative city. Should you find yourselves inspired by today's stories, please join us this Saturday the 5th for our Art 101 Writers Workshop, led by, the per led by the current Poet Laureate of the Santa Clara County. Try your hand at some creative writing inspired by the exhibition, Southeast Northwest. A quick note before we begin, if you can please keep yourselves muted, that would be appreciated. Um, our program is approximately one hour and will include a Q&A at the end. If you'd like to submit a question, please scroll to the bottom of your screen to where you see the chat icon to do so. We are so delighted to celebrate the launch of the book Silicon Alleys, Selected Metro Silicon Valley Columns from 2005 to, 2000, from 2005 to 20, with two distinguished San Jose fixtures, who are both unique historians and storytellers of local culture and life. We've had the pleasure to exchange stories and collaborate with both over the years through our annual Poetry Invitational program. The book's author, Gary Singh, is a journalist with a music degree, a published poet, and a longtime newspaper columnist at Metro Silicon Valley. Mighty Mike McGee is a funny stand-up poet, curator of Mighty Mike McGee's Must Seize column, and 2018 and 19 Poet Laureate of the Santa Clara County. Welcome our special guests, Gary Singh in conversation with Mighty Mike McGee. Hello everyone. Thanks Hello. for joining us. Hi Gary. How the heck are you? You know, I'm, uh, I would be lying if I said I was great, but I would also be lying if I said I was horrible. So I'm somewhere in between, you know? In between uh, is good. In, in between, between is good. It's better, than, it's better than the extremes, right? That's right. Um, it's good to see your face. You too. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we're here. Yeah. Um, I love sitting down and chatting with you. Um, I've always learned so much about the city that I love. And I, I, it's no, I don't think it's any, I don't think it's any, and there's any question as to how much you and I really dig San Jose. I think it's fair to say that we are two of this city's biggest fans. Um, which is also to say that we love underdogs, you know. Uh, so I, it's it's really cool to to be sitting here on a in a in sort of a professional way instead of sitting with some espressos uh, outside at a cafe as we usually do. Um, we're now doing this uh, on Zoom, and um, this is my first time ever doing Zoom ever. I've never been on Zoom before. This is new. I'm kidding. I'm joking, everyone. I lie. Anyhow. We are here today to talk to Gary Singh because um, Gary is, he is the chronicler, uh, whether he likes it or not, he has been a, the chronicler of San Jose for the last, for the last 20 years. And I think that, uh, I think it's safe to say that anyone who picks up the Metro, I would say that most people who are picking up a copy of the Metro are starting with you. The reason, one of the reasons they're even picking it up is because uh, you are such a, a, a part of it. Um, when, did you, when did you get involved with Metro, Gary? That's a great question. Um, I would say almost 20 years ago, um, I started writing for them probably the end of 2001, beginning of 2002 or so. Um, and I was writing you know, cover stories, art stories, music stories, um, all sorts of bizarre twisted adventures, um, you know, and just basically finding, I mean, I'd already written for several other magazines. I'd written online. I, this is right at, at, as the dot-com boom was kind of imploding, you know, so I had, I had had work as a freelance writer. I had done a lot of stuff, but um, as I, and I, at Metro, I figured, um, I would be there maybe like six months, <laughs> you know, and, um, but as, uh, um, as, it, as those months started to unfold, you know, I started to really, really find my own voice 
and they gave me the space you know, and all, to write it all, in pretty much every section of the newspaper, you know, and, uh, and, and I soon began to realize that, well, since I'm born and raised here, since I have an academic background and since I grew up in the libraries here and since I grew up as an artist here and a musician and as someone who looks at maps all the time, back when we had maps, real like paper maps, you know, and, um, and since I have an academic background and a, you know, thrash metal, punk rock, easy listening background, that somehow all of that spew it's oozed out of my veins and my pores and everything else. And all of that contributed to a natural snarky type of voice that could only fit in at an alternative weekly newspaper, you know? And um, so ultimately they gave, offered me my own column in 2005 and I figured it would last maybe like six months. Okay, I said, well, no one's gonna, what, what's the point? Okay, and then it just exploded. And, um, you know, so Metro didn't give me my start technically, you know, I had written for ever, other places, but they did give me a platform and a brand and a, or a platform locally to find a voice that really just it was so much fun. And, um, you know, and um, so now, you know, 1400 whatever stories later, you know, um, I'm still doing it. And, you know, I really did not think it would last this long. And um, it's been quite a journey, you know, and luckily I've been able to weave a lot of my own personal, you know, perspectives and my own personal troubles into the stories and do it in a way that, you know, is still entertaining at least. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and they are, and it is very entertaining. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from, I don't, I don't think you could be where you're at as a, as a writer in the, in the scope that you're in without, without really loving and being passionate about the, the, what you're writing about. And, and you, in, in, in a nutshell, you are writing about San Jose and the South Bay. You are writing about Silicon Valley. Um, <clears throat> so much so that your, your column is called Silicon Alleys. Was that your doing? Did you, did you come up with Silicon Alleys? No, they came up with the name. Um, and um, I never really even bothered to ask what the reason for it was. I mean, you know, I figured it would last six months. You know, what's the point of really uh, deliberating over it? Um, so it was never even explained to me the reason for the name, but it makes sense, you know, and um, over time, I just took it upon myself to decide what that meant. Okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you know, alleys can mean anything. It can mean geographically speaking, like, a, like a, an actual alley off the beaten mm -hmm. path that nobody knows about, or it can be, you know, creatively speaking, a subject that is off the beaten path or mm -hmm. some bizarre, you know, uh, you know, temple a spiritual temple in the middle of nowhere that i can go look at that's like spiritually off the beaten path you know so it just means alleys means anything way out of off the norm of anybody's normal routine you know and yeah. that's that sounded like an acceptable generalization for me to go with you know <laughs> so and and i and i think it's safe to say that so many of your so many of your your columns so many of your articles uh, do go off the beaten path you know they take us in a place where you really can i kind of a lot of times can only get to by foot and i think uh i think it's it's it, it'd be wise for folks to understand like if you don't know like gary literally walks everywhere everywhere if you if you've ever been downtown and uh and have, have, have been driving around downtown walking around downtown if you haven't run into gary singh then you aren't downtown enough uh because i think it only take a few a few excursions into downtown without running into gary in person or seeing him there's i i've had so many i live downtown and I, and most of the time we don't plan to meet up we just bump into each other and then walk into the cafe and 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 order coffee and talk I've learned a lot from Gary uh, over the years and in, in just being friends with Gary. Uh, it's, it's, you have, a, you have a, a fascinating mind uh, and I really enjoy picking it. Um, and I think it's, it's really kind of wonderful that we, we get an opportunity to sort of pick your brain every week. How hard was it? You, you've, you've put together a book, you've, you've, you've put together a collection of your stories. Uh, how long did it take you to whittle down 1400 some odd articles down to how many is it's a few hundred, right? 
Uh, well, in the book there, is, well, actually the Silicon Alley's column is about over 15 years. It's been every single week. So that's about just over 800 columns. Mm -hmm. 1400 is more if you like count all the other stories. I've sure. Yeah, so at, so going through it, I had to, I had to sit there and basically go through every single issue for, for over, from 15 years. And what I wanted to do was put together an overview because that was the best way to do this because um, I have written so such a huge variety of crazy stuff on that page over the last 15 years that there was no way to categorize anything, you know? So it had to be done chronologically for several reasons. Um, but to provide an overview was the best, you know, because there's, you know, there's a whole demographic of people that really just want, whether, or they don't say this in these words, but you know, there's a whole demographic of people that really love the old rock and roll stories. There's a whole demographic of people that like the, the, the Gary walks through the blighted wasteland stories and uses, you know, Taoism to, to, to figure it all out. Okay, there's a, there's a whole crowd of people that just want the older historical stuff. There's a whole demographic of people, maybe several that want the more ethnic uh, diaspora stories and what the underrepresented people were doing and the arts and, and, and the community. So there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of people that just want the soccer stories. Okay. You know, so there's, so I, th so I thought the best thing to do would be just to provide an overview of everything that was, uh, that has been on that page. And, you know, rather than throw it off balance by doing, focusing on mostly the music stuff or the art stuff or the historical stuff. So it, so it was, it really wasn't that hard. I just, I just had to go through every single issue and um, it was, you know, it was pretty arbitrary. You know, I figured, you know, just, okay, let's just make it a, make it a variety. You know, it'll be between um, 15 and 20 columns for every year, you know, 15 years. And that's what we came up with. And we, and I think it's a great variety of stuff that's in here. It's a fantastic bent matrix of, of perspectives on San Jose, California, you know, and it's not designed at all for anyone to read front to back. Okay, I mean, there's a, a great table of context, a great table of contents, a great index, you know, and it more functions like, you know, a Ramones greatest hits box set, you know, where every there's 100 million songs, and they're all two minutes long, and you just jump in however you want, you know, so nobody should feel obligated to read it front to back, you know, if someone does do that, if somebody is insane enough to do that, I want to meet that person. To, to read it from today, back to the early aughts. Yeah, you could do that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That would be that. Yeah, that would be very fascinating. Uh, and, and it is it is one of those books where you can just pick it up and start anywhere you want and 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 catch something uh, that I think is going to uh, is, is going to be pretty fascinating and will probably lead you into continuing to read the next story and the next story. Um, it's, it's interesting because I think it's almost, it's almost kind of like Netflix at this point, right? You can, you can now, you can now binge as much Gary Singh as you want right in front of you. Uh, you can watch an entire, you can watch the whole series uh, instead of getting it each week uh, like we used to watch television. Um, and uh, I, I, it's, I think what's neat for me is, is, going through and, and getting, getting San Jose and getting the South Bay from your perspective. Uh, what story, um, I, and I, I wanna, you know, I wanna thank the San Jose Museum of Art for even yeah. inviting us to do this today. Um, it's, um, it's I, I, a lot of their online programming has been really, really fantastic uh, this year uh, in, in such a strange year. What, um, what connection do you have to the museum, Gary? What, 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 what does the building mean to you? What does the space mean to you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the building at the Museum of Art is in, okay? Those of you that know the building, there's an old half of the building and a newer half of the building, okay? The old half of the building actually has quite a, a lucrative or lurid history, you know? I mean, it was, I mean, everybody, what everybody tends to mention is that it was the, it was the original post office about a hundred years ago. And it got damaged in the 1906 earthquake. That's why you see the flat top of the tower. The rest of the tower got knocked off. Okay, but nobody ever mentions that it was the public library in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. 
Um, nowadays, the main public library is on San Jose State's campus, the Martin Luther King Jr. Main Library. Before that, it was on San Carlos Street, but and that one opened up in 1970. Okay, before 1970, the building that is now the art museum that was the public library. You know, and my mom worked there as a librarian in the 60s before I was born, um, right before I was born. Um, so she's you know, got some great stories, you know, and that building, the old wing, you know, it was basically the public library. You walked in from the Market Street side um, and to the right was basically the checkout counter. And there was a great music collection. There was a great sheet music collection, a lot of which is now been saved and transferred through over the years. And if you go to the current library where all the records are on whatever it is, the second or third floor, those are all still car carried on and, and left over from, from the 60s, you know. And there's a sheet music collection there also. Um, the crazy story um, is that, you know, um, uh, if you know uh, the B generation, you know, like Jack Kerouac and Alan, Skin Alan Ginsberg, Neil Cassidy, all those characters, all those troublemakers, uh, they were not just associated with San Francisco, they have a long history here too, you know, uh, Neil Cassidy lived on East Santa Clara Street. It's actually that house right here at the corner of this book, you know. Um, the house is still there. You know, Ginsburg spent a lot of time there. Kerouac spent a lot of time there having an affair with Cassidy's wife. Um, Ginsburg went there, had an affair with Cassidy. Okay, you know, all this took place in that in, in that house right there. Okay, um, and then the crazy story that that keeps getting told about Kerouac is that he actually he had nowhere else to go and he had no money so he went and hung out at the San Jose Public Library all the time which is the building that is now the art museum the one hosting this event and that building is where he famously um, basically stole a copy of Dwight Goddard's The Buddhist Bible uh, or just checked it out and never intended to return it and then that book is what at least played a major role in Kerouac adopting the uh, Buddhist Dharma and, and trying to or use it to influence his life. Okay, so that all that happened in that building. Okay, and this is something that many beat generation fanatics around the world already know, but most people in San Jose have never heard of this, you know, and it's a typical San Jose story in that it's something that's famous all over the world, but the people here don't even know about it. There's a lot of stuff in San Jose like that, that, it, that, it, that gets pressed like all over the world or attention all over the world, but the people here have never even heard of it. What's another, uh, and I mean, if, if, if you're willing to, I would love to hear the story that you wrote about yeah. the, that part of the library, but uh, uh, and out of curiosity, what's another aspect of San Jose? What's another, what's another landmark or, or something that you would put a pin in uh, about San Jose that, that the world knows, but San Jose doesn't seem to know about? Oh, what that the world knows? Well, there's, I mean, I think in the, in the comments, somebody po po pointed out that uh, it tends to get swept up into San Francisco history, I think with the, the beats and what have you. Uh, yeah, and that a lot of a lot of our history does get swept up into San Francisco history. Yeah, I would say that, see, that is part of the San Jose condition, what I call it, not the human condition, the San Jose condition, because, you know, and it goes back to, you know, in the 60s, there were a lot of bands from here, you know, like Chocolate Watch Band and, you know, even Jefferson Airplane, a good portion of the band started here, you know, mm -hmm. and Grateful Dead was starting in basically, you know, the peninsula, you know, and, and they would go to San Francisco and Bill Graham would tell them, don't ever tell anybody you're from San Jose or the South Bay. You must say you're from San Francisco. OK, and that, of course, continues today. And Herb Cain, you know, spent decades insulting. Herb, Herb Cain is my hero, first of all. OK, and I'm not disparaging Herb Cain, but you know, he would spend decades making fun of San Jose in the press, you know, saying this is just 11 freeway exits in search of a city. You know, and which is true and to, and to a lot of degree. OK, but, you know, so all of this has been carried down through the decades and and it's which is a part of why San Jose has always struggled to achieve any kind of name recognition, you know, which in yeah. my case, it makes it that much more easy to write about because everything here is off the beaten path. OK, right. so, you know. I can write about anything and, call, and, and and justify it by saying it's off the beaten path. Okay, I mean, it, it, it's, okay, you know. it's true. 
It's true. And I also too, I think if, if, if Not everyone were, likes it when I say that, but that's true. Okay. It yeah. is true. It is absolutely true. And honestly, too, I think like you've kind of lucked out in a way to where uh, you get to write about all these things sort of first, right? If, if, if San Jose became more and more popular, people would start to notice things. And, and almost like it's almost like the Simpsons, right? They could go, somebody could then say, well, Gary already wrote about that. Gary already wrote about that. Gary already wrote about that. You know, and I think like you, you've gotten to a lot of the stuff that is part of our culture, our collective culture, uh, before anybody else could have. You know, you noticed that you noticed a lot of it first, or at least you were the first person to put it down on paper. Um, yeah. I, mean, I would like I to go ahead. I just, I just wanted to point out to folks that uh, a lot of the links, all, all the, most of the possible links to get your book are in the chat right now. Uh, if, if you want, you can, you can just highlight and select uh, those links and copy them over. Or if you'll notice in the chat, there's, you'll see three little dots on a little box. If you click on that, at the very top, it should say save chat. You can save that and it'll save it as a text document on your computer. Uh, and that way you can you can hang on to those links uh, and check them out later if you'd like. But uh, please, please go and, and buy Gary's book. Um, you will you'll be supporting a person who has been supporting us for a very, very long time. And, and you can buy it any way that you would normally buy books. You know, if you don't want to use Amazon, you can search through the independent bookstore network. You can go to, you know, bookshop or IndieBound, you know, any of those sites. Or if you want to call a place in person, Recycle Books has a few. Uh, they have some uh, Books Inc. and um, Campbell Hickleby's. or Hickleby's and Will Gwen. If they don't have it, they'll order it. Okay, so um, you know, so you can get it however you prefer to normally order any other book. You can you can support two institutions, two San Jose institutions in yeah. one by ordering through your local bookstore. Yeah, um, and all I've yeah all I've really wanted to do is is just compile this whole whole collection of stuff and maybe it'll inspire other people to you know um see the city and bent new perspectives in crazy ways and um you know it would be um you know i can't be the only one doing this you know there should be a, some kind of you know inspire i mean i mean it, i'm pretty sure that if people pick it up and look through all of this you'll find all these different themes that keep cycling back to different parts of the book like a lot of the stuff i'm writing about doesn't exist anymore for example you know mm -hmm. restaurants businesses galleries you know places of interest that aren't here anymore which is also a good part of the san jose condition you know a lot of things are destroyed you know and a lot of people that are natives at least they're always talking about what's not here anymore okay you know this is just mm -hmm. part of it that happens everywhere else in the world too but here it seems to be a lot more concentrated you know and um so i think the book will really have a lasting effect in that sense that if somebody's comes along in five years you know and discovers all these things that used to be right where they're sitting you know they will it's it'll, it's pretty mind-blowing you know? yeah uh, Diane Bracken says in the chat, I would love this as an audio book read, performed by Gary. Uh, that's a really good idea, Gary. Would you, do you think you have the, uh, the, the, the vocal wherewithal to, uh, to read all of, to read this entire book as an audio book? Yeah, a few people have asked about that. Um, I don't have any plans. I'm, I'll never say never. Okay. I'm not going to, yeah. I'm, I'm not dismissing it out of hand, but I, it's, I just don't, have the wherewithal to actually I've already written every other every one sure. of the stories so I so it's not part of my uh mentality to automatically want to sit and read every single one out loud but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen and we if enough people keep asking we'll find a way to do it maybe if it was spread out over time maybe if maybe if it was like a podcast and you did like three you read three of them at a time uh each week you know and people could yeah. tune in and listen you know I think that'd be yeah, kind of so cool so, so I don't have an answer, but um, it's not it's not out of the question. Well, I mean, if enough people really do think that you know, really want that to happen, we'll figure out a way to make it. I would listen. That's for sure. As a matter of fact, uh, if you would regale us with uh, the your museum story, uh, I would love it. Okay. So this is the the story we were just. This is the column that I wrote about Neil Cassidy's old house on Santa Clara Street. Okay, and um, it opens up with basically um, a mention of a, a photo show that was at the Beat Museum in San Francisco, which is actually in this book several times, even though it's not San Jose, but there's connections like this. 
And then, so after that, it goes into the story about um, uh, Neil Cassidy's old house. Okay. And then after that, we should be having enough, more than enough time to open it up for questions. And then after we talk about this for a few minutes. Okay. So this is uh, Neil Cassidy's old house on Santa Clara Street. I believe this ran in 2018. So it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a new book of lost imagery from the beat generation has emerged triggering this columnist to reflect on those celebrated literary troublemakers, some of whom spent serious time here locally. The beat scene photographs by Burt Glenn is a landmark collection, much of which is in color. A successful photographer on numerous fronts, Glenn took the shots between 1957 and 1960 in San Francisco and New York. All the usual suspects are included. Now, since Neil Cassidy's old house still exists at 1047 East Santa Clara Street, the sizable den of iniquity he shared with his wife, Carolyn, and their three kids in the early 50s, I feel obligated to foreground the history for Metro readers who may not have flipped through Allen Ginsberg's journals, Jack Kerouac's letters, or Carolyn's book, Off the Road. That house was legendary. If only the walls could talk. Neil was the uncontainable genius and prime culture jammer behind much of the beat generation. Among many other sordid escapades, he was immortalized as Dean Moriarty in Kerouac's novel On the Road and also drove the bus for Ken Kesey's merry band of pranksters. To this day, his legend lives on with much exaggeration all over the world. In August of 1952, Neil and Carolyn arrived in San Jose a city then aptly nicknamed Nowheresville, she wrote. Neil was holding down a job at Southern Pacific Railroad while planting marijuana seeds in the flower beds. This was back when phone numbers were identified by two letters and five digits. Theirs was CY70295. Kerouac stayed with the Cassidys several times at this house during the few years they lived there with Carolyn and Jack famously having a passionate affair. Flavors of this love triangle were immortalized in Kerouac's novel, Big Sur, one of his best books. Decades later, Carolyn spilled the rest of the lurid yarn in Off the Road. But not everything was hunky-dory. As the story goes, Neil and Carolyn were deeply engaged with the metaphysics of Edgar Cayce, which did not resonate with Kerouac, who was already looking eastward for inspiration. As a result, it was in San Jose that Kerouac stole a copy of Dwight Goddard's A Buddhist Bible from the San Jose Public Library, a book that became one of his first major conduits to Buddhism, leading to his embrace of the Dharma for years to come. Don't ever discount the importance of libraries. When Ginsburg finally showed up in San Jose to stay with the Cassidys for several weeks in 1954, even more drama unfolded. The Cassidys took him to goofy hypnotist parties in Sunnyvale, and Ginsburg even wrote of meeting spinster old lady Rosa Crucius. What's more, Ginsburg was madly in love with Neil. They'd already consummated encounters going back years, and by the time Ginsburg made it to San Jose, he was scribbling masochistic fantasies. Lucky for us, Ginsburg was so bored with Nowheresville that he filled several pages in his journals. The now infamous interlude described in various books went down in August of 1954. As Carolyn wrote it, she walked in on Ginsburg and Neil in Ginsburg's room, after which she then retreated back to the living room horrified. A few days later, she dropped Ginsburg off in San Francisco along with some pocket change and sent him on his way. Nevertheless, Ginsburg wrote some seminal poems while staying at the Cassidy house. He wrote love poem on theme by Whitman in which he fantasized about a threesome with Neil and Carolyn. In the back of the reel, another poem found him wandering desolate in the old San Jose railroad yard only to equate a discarded flower with the universal struggle for beauty and hope against the wreckage of the landscape. In the back of the reel inspired at least a few dozen of my columns over the years. At minimum, a plaque should be installed at 1047 East Santa Clara Street. I doubt the current owner would mind. Certainly the property value would increase. Certainly fans from around the world would visit. Will the Nowheresville City Council ever understand these things? Like Ginsburg's discarded flower, we can only hope. As we do on Zoom, we applaud with uh, silent hands. Well, 
ASL applause here. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, and that I think you just confirmed that uh, listening to you read your stories is is about as good as as actually reading your stories ourselves as well. It's nice to and I do <laughs> I will admit that when I read your when I actually pick up a physical copy of the Metro and I read your column, uh, I, I I I do read it in your voice as best as I can. I've heard your voice quite a bit, so I know it. So it's it's in my head, and and I hear you saying these lines because it it it. It, you have you have your language that I think is and your tone, your voice is is very specific and it really comes across in in what you write. Um, you there's sort of there's a, there's an irreverence, but there's also a love that is 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 always sort of sandwiched with that irreverence, uh, a, 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 an, an appreciation, you know. Um, so we have we have one question. Uh, well, actually, we've got a couple of questions coming. Uh, let's see. Um, so from Brian Cott, is it annoying for Gary to have people bother him when he's walking around downtown San Jose? I've bothered him quite a few times. Uh, is it annoying to you to, to get, to, do you get, do you get uh, uh, approached often, Gary? That's a great question. Um, and I'll be the first to admit that I'm, oh, I'm not always, um, the most hospitable person when um, people do that, you know, like anybody else, you know, um, but I would never tell anyone to go away. I mean, even if I, I probably do come off that way you know, sometimes to people, but um, I mean, it's annoying sometimes, but not all the time, you know, um, if, if the, I mean, it just depends on what mood I'm in. You know, I think anybody would tell you that, you know, if, um, you know, sometimes people walk up to me and, you know, they say, I like your column, you know, do you want, and then we, they have stuff to talk about. And uh, I'm a lot better than I used to be about it, you know, so if that makes any sense. Um, I used to be, back when I was still drinking and I was always in a really bad mood all the time, I would be a lot of testy and just kind of confrontational about it. And, um, but this was always, I mean, I'm the one with the problem here. It's not any, it wasn't anybody else. Okay, you know, sure. first of all, I'll say that. I'll, I admit that to anybody okay but you know and there but there are times when I wouldn't say it annoys me it's more just um it, it, it becomes exhausting more than annoying but I would never tell anybody not to talk to me I mean if I if I have done that to anyone I apologize and so it's just it's just um it's totally arbitrary that's hard to sort it all out sometimes you you've always struck me as more shy than people would expect, uh, and I think that it it it. I think that uh, I also I also read you as a person who is sort of surprised that people would know you. Sort of surprised that anyone would be interested in 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 approaching you, um, and not like not taken aback or offended. More like oh, like it's. I think it's a strange thing to be someone who puts things out into the world and then re and, and, and still, I mean, even 20 years later, I think it can be, uh, it, it's odd to realize like people are actually reading these, people are actually engaging with this. And then when they see you, they want to, they want to be able to comment. They want to be able to, to, to talk to you because they're experiencing it very tangibly. They're experiencing it by picking up a paper and reading it, or maybe even scrolling through uh, online and reading your columns online. Um, does it surprise you still that you have a readership? Do you, does it, does it sort of, does it, what, what, what boggles your mind these days? It doesn't <laughs> boggle my mind. I mean, I mean, I came from, you know, I, no, I can be vulnerable about this. No, I mean, I, I came from, you know, a, a really broken family, you know, so, and I have problems with, you know, feelings of unworthiness and unlovability, just like anybody else does. Okay. You know, so a lot of times I'm thinking, okay, well, I, you know, I am, maybe it does boggle my mind that people are, or that this is so popular, but I don't know. I'm so struggling to like, not be an egotistical prick about it. Okay. You know, and there mm -hmm. are times when, 
it, it gets more frustrating when because when I find people that haven't read it, and, you know, and then not because they haven't read it, not because I'm such an egotistical prick that they don't know who I am, but more that because I know that there's another hundred thousand people out in the whole city that would have loved all these stories if they had just read about it. And there's plenty right. of reasons why people yeah. don't read it. Okay, I mean the circulation of the paper is not one million people. Okay, we right. don't. We're in a pandemic right now. People don't just go outside everywhere whenever they want. Okay, you know, and mm -hmm. and the alternative press is not on everybody's radar. And a lot mm -hmm. of time, you know, so there's plenty of reasons. I mean, you could live here mm -hmm. for 50 years and not even go downtown, for example. Okay, in fact, a lot of people have lived here for 50 years and don't go downtown. Okay, you know, but sure. but so I think it's more just frustration with you know this could be so much more. It could be resonating with so much more people than I think it does, or maybe that's what it is. And then, I, I'm, okay. if, if, but if anything, it's, I'm just still struggling with trauma, and that's not been totally processed and healed yet. And there's always feelings of just you know nobody likes me. And if you're a writer, there's, if you're a writer of any sort, or a poet, or you know, you're always struggling with self doubt, no matter how famous you are. Okay, you know, and it's just it's all of that combined. Well, I, I I'm. I'm glad that it hasn't stopped you from doing what you're doing. Um, so uh, Christina Naughton asks, as a San Jose State alumna where I met Gary, I was wondering if there are any stories in the book about SJSU. There are uh, numerous stories in the book about SJSU. Um, if you go to the index, um, you know, it's about you, I, don't, I don't know if you can see this, but the index is about, you know, that big for SJSU. It's huge. Um, you know, um, you know, SJSU is a big part of me, you know, and I'm, and I'm hopefully, I hope, I hope I don't end up turning into one of these characters that is 95 years old and that just never made it out of the university orbit. Okay. You know, cause <laughs> there are people like that in the neighborhood, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. You know, um, but, you know, I mean, I went to, I mean, music is the only reason I went to college or stayed in college. You know, I was a musician. I was a, I was a piano player. I was a sound engineer. I was, um, you know, a computer audio programmer, hacker, software guy, keyboard synthesizer, you know, person, you know, and um, that's the reason I stayed in college. Um, I was an art student all through um, high school, which is where I know actually one of the people that asked one of the first questions, okay, um, or said something earlier, but, um, you know, so I've always, so, but arts and music education is why I went to college and stayed in college, and I was at San Jose State, I got two degrees there, um, you know, and I was there for the whole decade of the 90s, and, it's, and I'm still writing stories about what goes on there, because I'm just in the neighborhood, I mean, it's a huge part of downtown San Jose that never really factors in any of the plans of the downtown association or any of these advocacy groups or any of these crazy you know arts committees or whatever they always they always um sort of act like the campus is just some separate thing from the neighborhood and this is changing okay i mean the i mean to the city's credit they are trying to integrate it more into the urban fabric or, at, or to the, to the I mean, historically, the city and the university didn't really get along very well, okay, for decades, but that began to change. The library helped with a lot of that. And so over the last 15 years or so, this has improved a lot, but, but. Um, yeah, San Jose State's a bit of a city state. It's yeah. kind of, it's got its own, its, its own orbit. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and so it's I'm I'm always going to be attached to San Jose State if I'm still living in this town. There's no way around it. I go to the library all the time. I know a lot of people that teach there. Um, I I go. I have friends who teach there who let me sit in on their classes and and workshop poems that end up getting published because they let me sit in and workshop my poems in their classes with all the kids that are actually paying to be there and I'm not paying to be there. You know, so. I have a lot of connections there. It's a big part of my psyche. So um, it'll always be a part of me, even more than a lot of the rest of San Jose, really. You might not be paying cash to be there, Gary, but I think you're, you're, you're paying in a, in a sort of social cachet. Um, so uh, Paulina asks, what local tidbit slash story have you discovered over the years that is your most favorite that we should know about? That's a great question. Um, favorites are always difficult. I mean, it's like asking, you know, what's your most favorite? Every writer has a million people ask, like, what's your most favorite story? And it's like basically like saying, what's your, who's your most favorite kid, you know, of all your children, you know? But mm -hmm. um, there's been so many. Um, 
you know, I discovered doing all sorts of other research, you know, that Oscar Wilde actually came to San Jose in like 1883 or something like that. Oscar Wilde, the writer, you know, um, he went on a couple of tours across the United States. I, I mean, like multi-city tours, like 30 or 40 cities. I mean, long before rock bands were going on tours, Oscar Wilde went on tours all over the country in the 1880s and 1890s. You know, um, and, you know, and, and you can imagine, the, you know, you, you, just imagine the way Oscar Wilde dressed, okay? Imagine that guy coming to this town in 1886 when there was like 20,000 people here and people walking around, and, you know, and, you know, in horse-drawn carriage. And, and imagine Oscar Wilde shows up. I mean, just imagine what that would have been like, okay, you know? And um, that was in a building that is, was right next to where San Jose Bar and Grill is now, basically the parking lot that's right. It was somewhere in there. But um, so mm -hmm. there's always stuff like that that I discovered by accident while doing research for something else. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, all the great discoveries happened by accident, you know. Um, you know, and there's been a lot of like of spiritual type of events, you know, like, uh, you know, the guy that wrote the first Buddhist periodical in Santa Cruz and around the same time, 1880s, 1890s, he ended up living in a trailer park in San Jose and start helping start the Humane Society, you know, so there's always crazy, ridiculous, uh, coincidental types of things that happen uh, from conversations like the ones you and me have had, I had with somebody else and then all sorts of crazy connections happen. And that's mm -hmm. how I view the city. It's just a bunch of crazy connections that are different across space time shattering, you know, dimensions of, you know, reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <career>. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm curious if you know anything about this. Uh, there was a, a claim for a while that I read about where Chuck Berry might have been born in San Jose. Have you ever looked into that? Have you ever heard about that? Because he definitely spent time here as a child. There's evidence that he definitely spent time here, but he claimed St. Louis, or he claimed St. Louis, uh, but some folks are have been fighting to claim him as, a, uh, as, as San Jose being his birthplace, but he denied I, it. I remember reading that when, I mean, back when I was a kid, uh, or, you know, grade school, junior high school, I was heavily into trivia of all sorts, especially rock trivia, you know, I mean, I grew up listening to, you know, you know, um, you know, FM radio when I was like eight, nine years old, and I was reading rock trivia books, and I knew like all sorts of stuff. And there was one, one of those rock encyclopedias of history where they did list Chuck Berry being born here. And but that, but I had never heard that again until I was already grown up, and maybe like ten years ago when I ran into somebody else who was saying that. And um, I don't know either way, but I don't think that was true. I mean, I think mm. he was born, and as far as I know, I mean, I don't know, I don't know, but I don't. It doesn't. I I think that it would have been verified by now if that was true. Mm. I don't. Uh, know. It's it's I I've I've always been fascinated with those sorts of things. It's interesting, yeah. you know. It's better than knowing that Dustin Diamond was born in San Jose. I mean, Nikki um, Six of Molly Crew was born somewhere around like Sunnyvale or something like that. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of instances like that. It's not it's not, you know, it's there. I mean, you meet people that are just so struggling to achieve any kind of name recognition for San Jose that they'll go after. Not that it shouldn't be recognized, <laughs> okay, but it's just mm -hmm. that you know. Um, I mean, you don't have to celebrate every time, you know, like the bass player for Creedence Clearwater went to San Jose State for one semester or, or, he, or he graduated there or Stevie Nicks went there for one semester. Okay. I mean, it doesn't mean you need to turn that into like a promotional thing. I mean, you know, so right. it kind of gets, yeah. it kind of gets Fair enough. ridiculous after a while. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Rita Norton says, I enjoy Gary's restaurant reviews, inexpensive tasty hidden gems. Uh, so I'm going to turn that into a question and ask you right now during COVID, what are two restaurants that you've, you've frequented uh, as um, for, for takeout uh, at this um, point? I can get to Willow Glen very easily on my bicycle so, or on a lift bike, you know, so there's an Indian place at, um, I'm almost ashamed or to give it away, okay, but there's an Indian place at Bird and Willow or on Willow just west of Bird, which is kind of, it's called New Indian Cuisine. It used to be called Sue's Kitchen or Sue's Indian Cuisine back in the 90s and the early aughts. And um, 
this guy bought it about maybe 10 or 12 years ago. It's called New Indian Cuisine. They have, it's, it's cheap. It's, a, it's, it's a quintessential roadside, you know, stop place, uh, you know, that um, they have tables inside and they have one table outside, you know, so you could theoretically eat outside if you wanted to, but, um, but so right now they're doing takeout. And then if you want to eat outside at that one table or they'll, you know, they'll do that. Um, if, as long as it's, we're still in the phase where they're allowed to do that. It, it changes all the time now, but, but the that food place is, is my, fantastic. That place is my hidden secret. I go there all the time. It's cheaper than any other Indian place and just as good, you know, um, and they do a really good takeout business. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it used to be like a transmission shop or an auto parts place about 50 years ago. You can tell mm -hmm. by how it's laid out. So in the same way that, you know, in, um, in the same way that Roy's station in Japantown is, the best Buddhist reincarnation of a gas station, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. this place is, this is the best Punjabi reincarnation of the auto parts store. So that's, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of like when you see what was clearly obviously a Taco Bell from the eighties. Yeah. That is now a completely different restaurant. Uh, right. it's, yeah. You, yeah. Like I, a check cashing place or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, Diane B says, when I first met Gary at Gala back in 2004, he seemed very put off that I had no idea who he was, but later he was so down to earth and kind that evening. So that's just a comment uh, and a, a compliment, I think, to you, Gary. Um, Kim Welsh says, Kim Walesh says, when do we get to hear you play music again? That's a great question. Um... Right now, all I do is just, I have a keyboard that's uh, back there behind a bunch of other stuff. You can't see it, but you know, I, so I just kind of take it out and I, every four or five months or so, and just sight read a bunch of pop songs off the sheet music, just so I can see, just so I can, I know that I can still remember what key has three sharps in it and stuff like that, you know, but I don't have any plans to play right now. I mean, it depends on, it would take me only a couple of months of practicing every day to for it all to come back but i just um it's been so long and um right now we're in this time where, where we have all the time to do everything but nothing gets done that's how that's how my life is at the, you know, it's one, i'm one of those people i feel like i have a growing uh i have my to-do list is even bigger than it was back in march uh and and yet i feel like i've i've tackled most of my to-do list somehow then, it's it's gotten bigger then, for the person that I just asked you or who's who um met me in 2004 when i acted that way that is how i did act we i sort of alluded to this earlier okay that's when i was still i mean i'm not using drinking as an excuse okay i would never do that okay but th i did act that way to people before because and it wasn't because they didn't know who i was okay i wouldn't be so much of an egotistical you know jackass where i would do that mm -hmm. but you know but it's more just frustration because i think that there's so much going on here to write about but and so many people are unaware of it i think that's probably where the the standoffishness is coming mm -hmm. from and i just want people to really know about you know all this bizarre shit that's going on here so that's so if i did act that way to people i apologize it it does happen sometimes i think you're fine gary as a, as a former drinker myself uh i think uh you know being an alcoholic is not necessarily an excuse but it's it's a helpful explanation uh yeah, for why for certain behaviors i think you know um uh and i've i've i mean i've never been turned off by you uh and and that's not to say that my experience is better or 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 supersedes anyone else's um Let's see. Uh, I also went to SJSU for art. Gary was the buddy of the kid brother of my high school bestie. So of course, I never spoke words to him. Apologies for ever being terrible to you. If so, thanks for keeping my love of SJ alive. Uh, I concur. Uh, as a former SJSU student, I attended my first Friday art walks and enjoyed the scene there. More chill and less self-conscious than other places. Um, and then they also asked, Christina Deptula asked, uh, the downtown and cultural scene didn't really seem integrated into or supported by the rest of the city. I remember a lot of venues were struggling. Are people taking any measures to help the cultural life of SJ? Um, I, I will say before I pass that on to Gary, I, will, I would like to point out that I think uh, all of the museums 
and all of the galleries downtown uh, have really uh, helped to build the the arts and cultural scene in San Jose. They have been uh, losing them would be detrimental to uh, to our the, the 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 cultural relevance happening in San Jose. Up until pandemic, I felt like the the downtown was thriving more than I had ever seen it. Uh, take it away, Gary. What do you What are your thoughts on that? So the question is 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 uh, uh, is the um, uh, they remember a lot of venues are struggling. Are people taking any measures to keep the cultural life of as to help the cultural life of San Jose? Well, I don't. I mean, I'm not in the position to take measures or anything. But I mean, you know, the, there's many different dimensions to this. You know, I mean, the, the the main struggle is that you know downtown is only like three or four percent of the whole city. Okay, and, and people that are downtown all the time don't tend to realize that. Okay, you know, the I mean, you know, the city is a million people. Okay, you know, downtown is like what? I mean, just guess like. To even exaggerate it, I would say what thirty thousand people at the most. Okay, you know, I mean, I'm just guessing. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I don't know if it's because if you look at if you look at the district, right? So District Three is part of downtown, and I think yeah, uh, only, we're only downtown's only part of District Three. Okay, it's not right. You know, but, Understandable. So, so I would, I would, I would say forty thousand, forty to fifty thousand people. Okay, so that's downtown. four and five percent of the whole city. Okay, the entire rest of the million people, you know, have a hard time, you know, I get, this is nothing that is new. Okay. Everybody has argued about this for a hundred years and, you know, I don't see what's going to be, what can, will be done about it, you know, but you have to make downtown that people want to go to. And, you know, and every time there's a phase where something seems to be transforming into something better than something else happens and smashes it, you know, and um, the city never seems like it wants the kind of people moving here that are going to be arts and culture weirdos like us. They just want, you know, the more comfortable classes to be, you know, I mean, this is my opinion. Okay, I don't speak for anybody else, okay, or maybe, you know, but, but I mean, it's kind of, you know, there's, there's too many dimensions to their question to really, you know, answer it quickly. <laughs> well, and I, and I think, I think you and I have, do have a tendency. People who live here have to care about culture. Okay. That's the thing. Okay. The people moving here right now don't, they just want to come here and work in the tech industry and go to the Safeway and, that, and that's it. Okay. You know, you have to want to attract people to move here who are the people that want interesting stuff, not just $25 salads and, you know, you know, $25 beers and that kind of stuff. Okay. You have mm -hmm. to want people that are living here who are interesting people. Okay. You know, I mean, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, not that you and me are interesting and we're better than the tech workers. No, but it's, it's just, you have to want to attract people who value culture. Okay. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not that difficult, <laughs> you know, and maybe it's, maybe it's, it's up to people who it's do easier said than done, you know, but and, and and it's probably it's probably up to it's probably up to the sort of more creative types to draw in more creative types and say hey come come to this city you know come pay all of your money in rent yeah you can't uh, do that with three thousand dollars for an apartment to live in a place where there's <laughs> nothing to do okay you sure. know? yeah unless you know? um, unless you're willing to walk down all of the all of the silicon alleys yeah um yeah. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I, I I appreciate your honesty and your forthrightness. It really, uh, I think it really makes for a good, a, a much better conversation. Uh, Sean Shrum asks, how much of the quakes have made it into this book? Uh, there's a lot of stories about the the soccer team in the book. Uh, there's quite a few. Um, I don't want to just you know blow the whistle and everything, but the, the earthquakes have a lot of columns in the book, um, and you know and. Um, to make a long story short, if you don't have the first book I wrote, you know, I mean, I grew up as a little kid in the 70s and, you know, the soccer team is all that we had here, professionally speaking. So that's what we grew up with, you know, um, San Francisco had the Giants and the 49ers, Oakland had the Raiders and the A's and we had the earthquakes, okay, you know, so and, and you know, they, this, all these teams would do charity events with each other, okay, it was all considered the same thing, okay, there were no... There were no people claiming that it what that this was less major of a sport, okay, than the other ones, okay. And then, 
so that all fell apart and then went through very, and then now, so I just grew up with the sport. Um, I was a fan of every sport. You know, I grew up watching baseball in the late seventies. You know, I remember the, the Yankees winning two world series. I remember, you know, uh, when the Habs and the Islanders were winning the Stanley cup at that time, I remember all of this. Okay. I've watched every sport, you know, um, but the quakes of the team that we had here, I was from San Jose. That was my sport. So that's just how it all turned into, what it is and you know so the quakes are you know i wrote about it in my column a lot because nobody else is writing about it so like oh as <laughs> as with everything else that's in there it's what nobody else is going to write about so i may as well do it you know and and what a perfect segue uh mayra mayra flores says thank you gary for all that you do to elevate san jose and its culture in my humble opinion you are our herb king uh and and three claps for you uh, I think that was four on my count, but yeah. Uh, Janet Cervantes says, regarding downtown and the cultural scene, well said. I've always lived in San Jose prior to the tech industry. It was possible to rent a room in, in a house for $50 a month. <gasps> Ugh, that created the possibility of creating music, art, poetry in San Jose. Uh, and, uh, and according to uh, Sean, he got all of his copies of your the the San Jose Earthquakes book that you that you wrote uh, at Arcadia Publishing. Um, yeah, it's he, actually he got he got all his copies at Recycled. Yeah, it's actually um, History Press, not Arcadia Publishing. So Arcadia Publishing okay. bought History Press. Mm -hmm. So wherever you see the book listed, it gets listed as Arcadia Publishing, which is unfortunate because it then makes everybody think that it's one of those photo books that you see everywhere, oh, you know, right. like uh, the history of Italians and San Jose. So unfortunately, it gets displayed in stores with all those books and it gets displayed and it gets listed with all those but so that book is not Arcadia it's history press it's an yeah. actual book with 35,000 words that I wrote so it's there's there, there are there are a lot of photos okay but it's an actual book it's not just one of those not nothing to disparage the people that do those books but just um but um and if you bought them at recycle books that's good I would say um they do, as of last weekend, they did have a few copies of this, but, um, and I would definitely recommend Recycle Books. Right now they are, they are slammed because they got stuck with the latest wave of COVID restrictions. So they can only allow like 10% of their capacity to be in there. So they're really just um, hurting. And um, so if you go there, you know, don't be one of these you know, lobotomized libertarian slobs that puts their tongue all over the counter and protest. Okay, go there, be a nice person and buy books and give them money. They really need your support. Uh, on, on that note, uh, I, I added the, uh, the links to your book uh, and your website. Uh, please go and support Gary Singh. Uh, if there are no more questions, I would like to ask you one more question, Gary. Um, Oh, and Dan Charm says, no question, but I believe you should consider creating a podcast to get deeper into some of this material. Uh, I agree. I think it's a very good idea. And um, I know a ton of podcasters who would probably love to help out, if not myself included. Um, but my, my final question for you, Gary, is what is, because we're in such a, a, an unusual time, uh, can you just sort of speak on uh, your, your, your hopes and your views on the future as we as we sort of work our way into coming out of a pandemic what are you, what are what are some of the what are some of the hopeful things that you've you've picked up in the last several months i would say just a sense of gratitude more than anything else and i know many people are probably sick of hearing the, these things these i mean i don't mean to sound i don't mean that in a you know you know uh, you know hippy dippy you know you know you know um yoga dude sitting on the rocks kind of sense okay i mean you know i mean but it's uh, i think it um i'm hopeful that we will find a way to get through this um um now that we have uh, what looks like a much better administration coming into power as as handcuffed as they may well be depending on what else happens and you know but um i do believe that there is hope on the horizon um you know i do believe that there will come a day when people can be healthy and not have to risk all this kind of stuff you know and um 
as far as San Jose goes, you know, there's a lot of great stuff here to discover and a lot of great stuff to understand and explore. You know, I, I understand and also with notwithstanding that there's not everybody can just leave their house right now and go walk around in any group of people anywhere. Okay, of course not. But you know, there are there will come a day when the world opens up again. It will happen. It won't happen as soon as everybody wants it to happen, you know, and there's going to be people that are struggling unnecessarily like always. And hopefully maybe I can just have more space or more or find different ways to elevate more of the social justice type of stories and just those types of situations where to, to highlight and the struggles that people are having, you know, rather and find some way to weave that into what I normally do. That would be my hope, I guess. Well, I appreciate it, Gary, and I appreciate you very much. And I, I thank you for your time here today. Oh, look, there's links to my stuff too. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank Frederick Lang. I want to thank Paulina Vu. And I would also like to thank Melanie. Melanie, I don't even know your last name. I need to learn your last name. And then from this point on, I will always remember it. Yes, um, we were supposed to talk more about the museum, but I think, I think, we, I think we squeezed in a little bit. You know, I mean, it was a nine. Yeah. But um, I definitely want to thank um, the San Jose Museum of Art because I've been to so much, so many shows in that building even before I was a writer, you know. I mean, and it's been a huge portion of this um landscape for so many years and for those of you that don't go there it's not just like a museum museum they're doing some pretty you know avant-garde stuff over the last four or five years i mean seriously you know i mean there's been some some pretty radical stuff in that building and un unlike they've really ever it's a it's they're going in directions they haven't been before in a very good way so um right Absolutely. now they're right back not being able to let you know, I mean, they can't just throw a Sturgis rally and have 400,000 400, people in there, but, you know, so support them. They, you know, they're doing a lot of great work. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, this, uh, this Saturday, they're going to be doing, they're going to be holding a, uh, uh, an event uh, with the current Santa Clara County Poet Laureate, Janice Lobo Sapigal. Yeah. Uh, an ekphrastic poetry workshop. A ekphrastic poem is, means uh, you take a piece of art and you write a poem about that. And, uh, and uh, oh, thanks, Sean. Uh, Sean just posted a link to, uh, to a poem. Yeah, and, both of us have done that event, mm -hmm. or done events there. Just speaking of this, at the museum, okay, every year they have an event where you write a poem in response to the artwork. And I think bo in both of our cases, it produced a totally different type of poem. Oh, yeah. What we Very normally so. do, you mm -hmm. know? And so it's, an, it's amazing that, you know, it's not just a museum, that's all I'm saying. There's so much mm -hmm. stuff going on there, you know. The next one is in April, like Paulina just said, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, so keep them so, on your radar, subscribe to their mailing lists, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing all sorts of just, you know, yeah. avant-garde stuff right now. And 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 they will come to you. Uh, there, there's so much programming coming yeah. from the San Jose Museum of Art that will come to right into your home. Uh, and it's 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 all very well worth it. Um, uh, S J M U S A R T uh, dot org slash connect, and that is in the link. Thank you, Melanie Same. Thank you, Frederick Leong. Thank you, Paulina Vu, for putting us here. Thank you to everybody who came and attended. Please go and buy Gary's book, um, and um, and then and then find him downtown and have him sign it at a socially safe distance. Uh, and then um, and uh, thank you to the San Jose Museum of Art. For, for being here today. And, uh, but mostly, thank you, Gary. I appreciate you and everything you've brought to this city. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much, and you've brought a lot too, so.